I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. Well, you would think they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture and their religion. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted, they danced, they, they made sacrifices to their idols. But they had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. You don't really relate, do you? Let's try it again. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted, they danced, they, they made sacrifices to their idols. But they had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. Idol worship. It's not just about golden calves anymore. I know what you're thinking. What a, what a terrible video to play on the first Sunday of NFL season, right? Uh huh? I certainly don't mean to insinuate that every football fan is an idol worshiper. If you'd have been at the Burkholder household yesterday, you would have seen all of us in our red Ohio State shirts. And even though we didn't uh, paint our faces, we were worshiping. You have to admit, though, that there are many similarities. There are many people who elevate, whether it's football, or whether it's another sport, or whether it's something else, they elevate that activity, that person, that possession in their life, they elevate it to God-like status in their life. That, that leads me to the question that I want us to contemplate this morning. I kind of want you allow this question to sink into your mind and in your heart. The question is this, what are, the, what are the idols of your heart? I'm not asking today what are the idols of pagan countries in the Orient or, or pagan countries in, uh, in um, Southeast Asia. I'm not even necessarily asking what are the idols of our culture, and even though we're going to talk about that just a little bit, because our culture has idols that we worship. But the question that I really want us to contemplate, and I really want us to dwell on today is this, what are the idols of your hearts? I've spent a significant amount of time this week asking myself, that question. What are the idols of my life? I have to admit for me, that's been a little bit of a difficult process. And I have to admit that I think God's done some house cleaning in Brian's life today. I'll say more about that in just a little bit. But the question that I want us to honestly ask ourselves this morning is this. Would you ask yourself this question? What are the idols of my heart? What is it that I place before God in my life? Let's pray together. Would you bow your head and take just a moment in your heart and say, okay, God, I open myself up to you. Speak to me this morning. Don't necessarily speak to the person beside me or to my spouse. God, I'm asking you to speak to me this morning. Father, thank you that Jesus is our Messiah. Thank you that he's Lord of Lords. Thank you that he's King of Kings. Thank you that the future is already settled in the mind of God. Your kingdom will come to pass. Lord, I pray that you would help us to live our lives now, in this very moment, 
as citizens of the kingdom. Recognizing you as our Lord, recognizing you as our King, making sure that you and you alone are on the throne of our heart, of our life. Not someone else, not something else, but you and you alone. You are the only one that is worthy of our worship. So today we worship you. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would, would speak to us, me, us, individually today and do a work of grace in our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We're in Acts chapter 19 this morning. I want to read a little bit of a lengthy passage. Our message is going to be a little bit different. I want to walk through this passage, kind of explain it, and then I want to get very practical, very personal today. It's easy for us to look at a story like this and think it's something that happened a long time ago and applies to them, and it doesn't apply to us, but I want to get very practical today. I want to get very personal, and um, let me say before we ever start, I'm probably going to step on your toes today. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because I've stepped all over mine all week long. And I'm tired of walking on my feet, so I'm going to walk on yours this morning. All right? Beginning in Acts chapter 19, verse 23, follow along, we'll put it up on the screen. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. Let me pause. What's taking place here is taking place in the city of Ephesus, and it's on one of Paul's missionary journeys. Verse 25, these, these craftsmen gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. They made, they made trinkets, they made shrines that were to the goddess Artemis that we'll talk about in just a few moments. And they say, God, this business, this religion is how we obtain our wealth. Verse 26, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people saying that gods made with hands are not gods at all. There is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worships. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus and uh, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, that might be a word you're not familiar with, the leaders, the, the community leaders who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him, Paul, don't go into the theater. Now, some cried out one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion. I thought this phrase was interesting. And most of them did not know why they had come together. You see, the the tendency of man to kind of follow the crowd, be be, be, uh, influenced by everyone else. 33, so some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd, but they recognized that he was a Jew, And after that, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone which fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. What a smart man. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he said these things... He dismissed 
the crowd. So let's kind of walk through this. I want us to understand there's some parts of this story that I think it's, it, it's significant for us to understand so that we can come to some conclusions. The first thing, if you're following along in the outline that I gave you, you'll notice that in the very beginning, it uses this phrase called the way. In verse 23, it says, about this time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, capital W, A-Y. What is that referring to? Well, the phrase the way was an early name for the Christian faith. So here, the Apostle Paul is in the city of Ephesus, and Demetrius, these followers of Artemis, this goddess, all of a sudden have a problem with whom? With the followers of Jesus Christ, with the followers of the way. By the way, you'll find that phrase some five or six times throughout the book of Acts. It actually is found twice in Acts chapter 9. And you say, where does that name come from? Most think it comes from Jesus' own words in John chapter 14 and verse 6 when Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. And so one of the very first names that was given to Christianity was the name The Way. And people would say, I am followers of The Way. The second thing that we see in the passage is this. The major deity in Ephesus was a female god named Artemis. You see her mentioned throughout the passage. Let me just pause for a second and tell you a little bit about Artemis. In Greek mythology, if you're familiar, I know we took Greek mythology clear back in high school probably, but in Greek mythology, Artemis was the daughter of Zeus and Leto and the twin sister of Apollo. She was recognized as the goddess of chastity, the goddess of virginity, the goddess of the hunt, and also the goddess of the moon. There were more than 30 worship centers dedicated to her throughout the then known world. By the way, she was also, you you might be familiar with her other name, she was also referred to as Diana in some places. The goddess Artemis or the goddess Diana. And you even see in verse 27, he talks about the fact that she is worshipped by all Asia, and she was worshipped by all of the world. The temple of Artemis in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world world. I think we have some pictures. That's a, that's a drawing of what they think the temple of Artemis looked like. Huge, magnificent structure. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And by the way, there still runs. If you go to Ephesus, which is in Turkey today, you can still see runs. We have another picture that shows part of that temple that is still there. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Verse 35 adds a different twist because it speaks of a meteor that fell from heaven. Talks about this meteor that fell from heaven that they worshiped, that was located there in that temple. And they said, the residents of Ephesus said that this meteor that fell from heaven had the form of of Artemis. And so it was sent, they actually said that it was sent from Jupiter, another one of the gods, and he sent it down to Ephesus so that they could further worship their god, Artemis. And so as you read through this story, you see a city that was not only wholly given to idolatry, but a city that was dedicated, completely dedicated to the worship of this goddess Artemis. The next thing that I wrote in your notes is this. The worship of Artemis was not only a religion, but it was the heart and soul of Ephesian culture and of Ephesian business, of the Ephesian economy. Demetrius, we already read it. Demetrius gives this impassioned speech in which he raised two concerns to the Ephesian listeners. First of all, he was scared to death of religious ruin. He was scared to death that that as more people became followers of the way, more people became followers of Jesus Christ, that it would actually bring down the worship of Artemis, of Diana. He was, wor- he was worried that, that her magnificence would be lost, that she would be the dethroned. In verse uh, 27, he says, and we're worried that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worships. But he also talked not, not only about the fear of religious ruin, but the fear of financial ruin. You see, Demetrius was a silversmith. 
And there were many, many craftsmen in the city of Ephesus. And Demetrius made these silver shrines that most believe were small replicas of the temple to Artemis. And this is how Demetrius and and many other artisans, many other craftsmen earned their living. And because the temple of Artemis, the great temple of Artemis was there in Ephesus, people flocked from all over the then known world to come and visit this temple. And obviously, as they were there visiting this temple, they would purchase these shrines and these relics and these pieces, these figurines that were made by silver. And many people in Ephesus earned their living because of the goddess Artemis. And so Demetrius was worried that anything that tarnished Artemis' reputation would not only lower the status of the city of Ephesus, but it would hinder civic pride. And above and beyond that, it would disastrously cripple the city's economy. And so Demetrius gives this impassioned plea that we just read. The, the next thing that I want us to see, though, and this is where I want us to go with all of this, in the midst of this, we see the ministry of the Apostle Paul. As Paul shows up in this city that was dedicated to idolatry, this city that was dedicated to the worship of Artemis, and the Apostle Paul comes in and begins to declare Jesus Christ and begins to preach the gospel, we find that Paul realized it was not only important to preach the gospel, but it was important for him to identify and confront the idols of his day. And so Paul not only preached Jesus Christ, but Paul called out the idols of his day. Demetrius quotes Paul's own words. Demetrius says, this man, Paul, says that gods made with hands are not gods at all. What was taking place? Paul realized that in order for the gospel to be effectively preached... Paul had to juxtapose, he had to compare the idols of the culture with the truth of the gospel. So Paul, as you read through the book of Acts, Paul continually took on the idols of the culture where he was ministering. We see that here in Acts chapter 19. We also see it in Acts chapter 17. If you remember the story when Paul was in Athens and he stood on Mars Hill And he stood in the middle of this pantheon of Greek gods. And there were these these statues, these busts made to all of these Greek gods. And and the Greeks were so worried they didn't want to offend any god that they had these, these statues, these busts made to all these gods. And they even had one that said to the unknown god. And Paul stands up on Mars Hill and says, hey, let me talk to you about the unknown god. The god that you do not recognize. And there in Acts chapter 17, he what? He preaches Jesus Christ. He calls out the idols, and Paul preaches the gospel. Here's my point that I want us to catch this morning. In order for the gospel to be effective, we must identify the gods of our culture, and we must identify the gods of our personal lives. We're in the midst of a series that we're calling Rediscovering the Gospel. And uh, two weeks ago, we started that. Brad preached a phenomenal message last week in which he traced the gospel through the entire scripture that points toward Jesus Christ. Well, following the example of Paul, it's not only important, it's not only significant for us to point people to Jesus, But it's also significant for us to identify, call out the gods of our culture. So today we not only explain the passage, but today we want to talk about idolatry. Because here we see the Apostle Paul doing that in Acts chapter 19. What is idolatry? And I kind of want to maybe change our mindset just a little bit this morning as to what idolatry really is. So, so let's look at a couple of passages of Scripture today, all right? We'll start in Acts chapter 20. 
a passage of scripture with which you are very familiar. Acts chapter 20, and we'll put verses 3 and 4 up on the screen. Notice these verses. You know these. So, so here's what God tells the children of Israel. You shall have no other gods before me. You shouldn't make for yourself the carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So here's the command that God gives to the Israelites. Don't make a carved image and bow down to it. We understand that, right? Now, if you're like me, you read through that and you think, okay, I'm all right. <laughs> all right, I don't have an image of Buddha outside of my house. Um, my wife and I have never taken the time to take a knife or a chisel and make an image, and so we're not worshiping another image, so for the moment, there's no idolatry in my life. If you're like me, I read that and think, good, I'm off the hook, all right? Let's look at the next passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 1. Paul, speaking to the Romans, says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. I think we have another verse, do we, Julio? Or is that it? And therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their minds to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Verse 25. Therefore, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So if you're like me, I read that and think, okay, we don't have an image to a serpent at our house. We don't have an image to a bird at our house. For years, Vicki and I served as, as missionaries in Mexico. And years ago in Mexico, uh, uh, the native tribes worshiped a god they called Quetzalcoatl, which is the serpent god. And today, if you go to Teotihuacan, the pyramids just outside of Mexico City, you'll see these pyramids. And all along these pyramids, there's this serpent god. I think we have a picture, Quetzalcoatl, and they worship this serpent. So, so you and I read that passage in Romans chapter 1 and Exodus, and we think, okay, we have no carved images of gods at our house. We have no images to serpents and birds. Once again, we kind of check it off the list and say, okay, good shape. No idolatry in the Burkholder household. No idolatry in your household. Let me show you another verse. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Paul says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly, in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desire, and covetousness. And notice this phrase, which is what? Which is idolatry. <laughs> he makes the exact same declaration in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5. So now the Apostle Paul is moved, and he's saying that idolatry is not just the worship of images. It's not just having carved images in my house and yours. It's not just something that I externally bound down to, this external God, this pagan God. But now he's saying that an idol can be what? It doesn't just have to be this image, but it can be what? It can be an attitude of my heart. It can be an action that I demonstrate in my life. It can be anything which takes the place of God. Let me give you a definition of idolatry in your notes. This is the way that we've defined idolatry. Idolatry is anything or anyone that captures your heart, mind, and affections more than God. An idol is anything, anything or anyone that captures your heart, your mind, and your affections more than God. Think with me today. Anything that gives you more joy than God is an idol. Anything that gives you more satisfaction than God is an idol. Anything that gives you, and by the way, not just you, but me, Anything that gives you or me more fulfillment than God is an idol in our lives. That brings me to the next thing that I wrote in our notes, and it's this. Please follow along. We're getting to a point here, all right? There is a difference between pagan external idols 
and personal, internal idols. There is a difference between pagan external idols and personal internal idols. When you and I think of idolatry, what do we think of? We think of paganism. We think of people who live in foreign lands who have never been exposed to the gospel and have this pagan, this external idol to which to whom they bow down. When we think of idolatry, that's what we think of. And so we classify it as saying, okay, man, no idolatry in our country, no idolatry in our church, no idolatry in our household. And we find that even the Apostle Paul makes a distinction between pagan external idols and personal internal idols. External idols, external gods can be observed. Internal gods are secret. Everyone knows when you worship an external God because you bow down to it. You may be worshiping an internal God, a personal idol in your life, and no one knows about it. David Clarkson, the Puritan preacher, stated that soul idolatry or personal, personal idolatry is much more dangerous than pagan idolatry. Why? Because soul idolatry is secret. Your family and your friends know if you're worshiping a, an idol. Your family and your friends know that you're worshiping a pagan god. But no one knows if you adore if you cherish, if you find fulfillment in anything else or anyone else other than God. It's an internal, personal idol. The next thing that I wrote in my notes is this. Anything can become an idol, even good things, when it becomes the ultimate thing. You see, for us, if we're not careful, we have this mindset that idols are just bad things. And idols can be bad things. But idols can also be good things in our life that we have elevated to ultimate status. We have elevated this to a status above God. Intrinsically, this thing, this person, this hobby, this habit is not bad. It's not sinful in and of itself. But we have taken this good thing and we have raised it above God. And this thing or this person, which intrinsically is naturally good, has become more important than God in our lives. And whenever that happens, that becomes an idol in our life. So yes, understanding that football can be an idol in our life. But so can your children. So can your spouse. So can your job. So can your boats. Even you can be the idol of your life if you elevate your needs, your wants, your desires above God. You see, anything that gives you more joy, more satisfaction, more fulfillment than God is an idol. And be assured of the fact that God is a jealous God. God does not want to share his glory. God doesn't want to share his worship. God doesn't want to share your adoration with anyone else. He doesn't want to share his ability to give you peace, his ability to give you joy, his ability to give you satisfaction. He does not want to share that with anyone else. He desires to be the most important person, the most important thing in your life. So that brings us to the next point in our outline that simply says this. What you worship what I worship, what I take to ultimate status in my life shows the condition of my heart. And it shows the condition of your heart. Let me show you a couple of verses. The first one I think you're familiar with. The second one I'm not sure. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse nine. The prophet Jeremiah makes this powerful statement. 
He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And and so let's just kind of blow off some stereotypes here, okay? Uh, Your heart is not intrinsically good. My heart is not intrinsically good. My heart does not push me towards God. Your heart does not push you towards God. Our heart, what? Pushes us away from God. And so if we trust our hearts, if we trust our emotions, if we trust our own feelings, we're in trouble. Why? Because our heart is going to deceive us. Our heart is going to lead us in the wrong direction. I saw this illustration this week, simple bicycle tire, all right? I don't know, I know we have some bicyclists in our our congregation, so I learned today, this is called the hub right here, okay? Where's Jason, right? This is called the hub, right? And so from the hub come out all of the spokes, all right? So imagine today that this, this hub is your heart, All right, and imagine that each of these spokes represent a sin in your life. All right, so let's just talk for a second about all the sins of Vicky. Or no, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to do that. Okay, I got to go home today. So let's talk about all the sins of Brian. Okay, and so, 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 so all the sins of Brian: pride. All right, selfishness, anger a tendency to maybe exaggerate and not tell the truth, selfishness, all of those sins that Brian demonstrates in my life, I tend to emphasize, and if we're not careful, we put the emphasis on those sins as if those sins were the problem. But each of those sins go back to where? They go back to the heart. And so the fact that that you're a liar, all right, and I don't know you, I'm not being accusatory, all right? The fact that you're a liar is a problem, but that's not the ultimate problem. The fact that you're unfaithful to your wife is a problem, but that's not the ultimate problem. The the, the fact that you're greedy and covetous is is a problem, but it's not the ultimate problem. The ultimate problem is what? It's your hub. It's your heart. It's what you truly worship. Why am I unfaithful to my wife? And I've never been unfaithful to my wife. This is hyperbole I'm talking about, okay? Why is a man unfaithful to his wife? Because at that moment, he's elevated his desires above what? Above God. So all of a sudden, my desires, I myself, have become the God of my life. Why do I have an anger problem, which is a spoke? Why do I have an anger problem? That goes back to what? It goes back to something that I worship in my life that at that moment becomes more important than God. So Jeremiah says, your heart is deceitful. It is desperately wicked. Don't trust in it. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what are the idols of our heart. Let me show you another illustration, Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, this is a passage that I found this week and it really spoke to me. Ezekiel 14, then certain of the elders of Israel came to me, Ezekiel is saying and sat before me. So Ezekiel is meeting with the elders of Israel. All right, God, God speaks to Ezekiel and the word of the Lord came to me. Verses three and four. Son of man, these men have taken their idols into where? into their hearts, not into their homes, not into their communities. These men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Do we have another verse or is that the last verse? Verse four, therefore speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, any one of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart and sets a stumbling block of iniquity before his face and yet comes to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him as he comes with a multitude of his idols. Here's what, here's what Ezekiel is saying. Ezekiel is saying that that your idolatry, my idolatry, is like a hand in front of my face. It obstructs my vision. It, It blinds me. It makes me far more likely to make a mistake. My idols, what? Keep me 
from seeing God clearly. I might be an elder in Israel. I might be a spiritual leader, but there is something that I have elevated to God-like status. There is something in my heart that's in the hub of my life, and it's, in, it's right in front of my face. But for some reason, I can't see it. Do you ever have a friend who was having a significant issue in their life, and you could see what the problem was in their life, but they couldn't see it? it It was right in front of them. They were dealing with it, but they were what? They were blind to it. They couldn't see what their problem was. They couldn't see what their idol was. Listen, here's what I want you to catch this morning. Idolatry is a threat to your very soul. Idolatry is a threat to your soul. It's a threat to my very soul. And if I'm not careful, I live my life thinking everything is fine. But there's something in my life that is obstructing my vision of God. It's blinding me. And it's causing me to make mistakes. It's causing me to commit sins in my life because I'm focused on what is in front of my face and I am not focused on God. So, what is idolatry? Idolatry is anyone or anything that captivates your heart, your mind, your soul more than God. Let me say this too, and this is something I've had to struggle with. Idolatry is not just something that unbelievers struggle with. Idolatry is something that believers struggle with. That's what I sat down this week, and I know our, our time's running, but sat down this week and, and, and asked, what are the idols of our culture? What, what are the things in South Florida that we elevate to godlike status. I, I asked all kinds of pastors that this week. And as you can imagine, I asked about 10 pastors, and guess how many answers I got? 10 different answers, all right? And so all of them were good. In our culture, we worship sex, do we not? In our culture, we worship success, do we not? There, there's so many things we worship. I, I came to three culturally. Three is this. The first is this. We worship lifestyle in our culture. Man, we got to obtain. Got to have a new car. Got to have a nice house. We got we to keep up with the Joneses. I have no idea who the Joneses are, but we got to keep up with them. All right? And so we strive. It's more important for us to keep up with the Joneses than it is Jesus Christ. I thought, boy, we might not know who the Joneses are. Let's put it there. It's more important to keep up with the Garcias than it is God, all right? We might get that in our culture just a little bit more, all right? Lifestyle. Here's another one. Leisure. Leisure. Oh, my word. I got to get away. <laughs> I got to get away, all right? And, and, and we live in the leisure capital of the world, so, so if we're not careful, vacations, and, and I'm not saying don't take a vacation. I'm certainly not saying that. We're going to take a vacation, all right? But, but, but if we're not careful, that becomes more important than God. Leisure. Family. Oh, I know I'm going to step on toes. Family. When, when all of a sudden the needs and wants of my kids my husband, my wife, becomes more important than pointing them towards God. I read an author this week that encouraged parents to do the 10-year principle. I've never heard this before, the 10-year principle. Your child's eight years old right now. 10 years from now, how faithful is your child going to be in the house of God? How faithful is your child going to be to the things of God? How, how can we think right now that we push our kids towards other things that aren't God and we think in 10 years God's going to be the most important thing in their life? We what? We deceive ourselves. We fool ourselves. So, so the question, though, 
is not what are the idols of South Florida. The question is this, what are the, uh, what are the idols of your heart? What are the idols of my heart? Let me give you a couple of steps today to help you determine that. I can't tell you what the idols of your heart are, but I know someone who can, all right? Step number one is this. You must open yourself up before God. Here are some great verses. You know these verses, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. David says this, search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Sometime today, get alone with God. Read those verses and pray a prayer as simple as this. God, I want to know. God, I really want to know. What are the idols of my life? What are the things that, that I elevate above you? What are the things that give me more comfort, that give me more refuge, that give me more joy, that give me more satisfaction than you? God, I want to know. Search me, oh God. God, know my heart. You know me better than I know myself. Tell me what my idols are. And I read one author this week that said, don't just do it one time because you're hard-headed. Do it three different times during the course of the day. God, what are the idols of my heart? I did that this week. I would love to tell you that your pastor is not an idol worshiper. I would love to tell you that there are things in my life, there's nothing in my life that is more important than God. But, but as I got along with God, God, with pinpoint accuracy, convicted me of good things. You said, Brian, what are the idols of your life? Can I be transparent? Please don't judge me, okay? Don't walk out of here saying, I'm going to a different church because we have a carnal pastor, all right? All right? Ministerial success is an idol in my life. Sometimes I'm more important on a Sunday morning, I'm more interested on Sunday morning whether we have a big crowd than being used of God. Vicky used to, when we were missionaries in Mexico, we'd leave and you know, we were in part of a growing church and we'd, we'd be on the way home and I'd be discouraged and she'd say, what are you discouraged about? Oh, we only had 295 in attendance this morning. I wanted 300. And in her calm, loving, pastoral way, she'd look at me and she'd say, you are so carnal. <laughs> we, had, we had people saved this morning. There were visitors there. And that's what you're upset about? I wish I could tell you that I've grown beyond that. I still struggle with that as a pastor. I struggle with wanting to please everybody. And sometimes I struggle with stating the truth to someone because I don't want them to get upset at me. And some of you know, if I think you're upset at me, I'm picking up the phone, we're going out to coffee. I can hardly stand it for someone to be upset at me. And quite frankly, you can't be in ministry very long with people being upset at you. Listen, here's what I'm saying. I had to do that in my life. And God indicated to me, Brian, there's some things in your life that give you more joy, more satisfaction, more fulfillment than me. And I'm working on that in my life. Ask God to point out the idols of your heart. I promise that he will. Here's the second thing quickly. My time is done. The second thing is this. You must ask the right questions. Ask yourself the right questions. Let me give you some real quickly. What makes you happy? Now, not that God doesn't want you happy and there can't be things in life that give you happiness, but what makes you more happy than God? What, what makes you scared? What is it that takes away your faith? What is it that takes away your peace? What, what scares you? What can't you live without? What if all of a sudden you thought, oh my word, if I lost that, I just couldn't live? That might be an idol in your life. What are you willing to sin? Or for what are you willing to sin to keep? Maybe you're in a relationship and you know, I'm going to be straightforward, having 
premarital sex with this person is a sin, but you're so scared you're going to lose this person that you do it anyways. That person's a God in your life. That person has become more important to you than God because now you're willing to do something for that person that you know God doesn't want you to do. So that person, you've, at that moment, you've elevated God above that person. There's so many different things. What do you turn to for refuge? Who do you turn to for comfort? Who do you turn to for joy and satisfaction? If it's not God, that person, that thing, that habit has become a God in your life. What do you pray for? What, what a pen, penetrating question. For what do you pray? Ask yourself those questions. And it might even be good to ask somebody else those questions about you. Because we tend to not be honest with each other. The third thing is this, make the right choices. Make the right choices. Here's three, soak up God's word. David said, your word have I hid, have I stored up in my heart that I will not sin against God. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is active, it's powerful, it's a sword that, that what? Discerns into your mind and in your spirit. You might sit back and say, Brian, I have no idea what my idols are. You know what that indicates for me? You're not spending enough time in God's word. Because if you're spending time in God's word, he's going to what? He's going to be pointing fingers at your life like he does mine. Stay connected to God's family. Now, notice I didn't say just attend church. As important as that is, but stay connected. There's a difference. Yes, you need to attend church, but you need to be plugged in. You need to be part of a small group. You need to be part of an accountability group, somebody who can keep you on track, someone who can encourage you when you need encouragement, a place where you can minister and use your gifts, a place where you can grow together. Starve your idols. Starve your idols. Every choice you make in your life either feeds your idols or starves your idols. Don't put anything sinful in front of your eyes. Don't go to places where you know you will be tempted. Don't hang with individuals that you know will pull you away from God and cause you to gratify the flesh and dishonor God. Starve your idols. Paul says this, Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. How foolish are we when we think that we're stronger than temptation? How foolish are we when we think that we can, we can confront temptation and it not defeat us? You're not going to defeat the idols of your life. You can't do it on your, on your own. You need Jesus. Here's, here's my last point today. Apply the gospel to your idols. Whatever they are. You say, Brian, what does that mean? The gospel is about forgiveness. It's about forgiveness. Claim the forgiveness that has been given to you. You're not going to be perfect. I'm not going to be perfect. And so on a daily basis, I wake up and say, okay, God, man, I know I haven't been perfect, but today I claim the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that is mine through the power of the gospel. I claim that. The gospel is about forgiveness. The gospel is about surrender. Realize that you cannot overcome your idols on your own. Continually surrender yourself to Jesus Christ. And the gospel is about victory. The gospel is about victory. Claim the victory that is yours. I, I meet with Christians all the time, and our praise team's coming, but I meet with Christians all the time who live defeated. And if we're not careful, we can have this mentality that, you know what, I'm just going to be defeated here while I'm on the earth, and I'm not going to have victory till I get to heaven. Listen, I get it. We're not going to be perfect till we get to heaven. But Jesus, the death of Jesus Christ, not, over, not only overcame the penalty of your sin, but it overcame the power of sin in your life. And victory is available, whatever that sin, whatever that temptation, whatever that struggle that you're going through, victory is available through Jesus Christ. You don't have to bow down to that idol anymore. You don't have to give in to that idol anymore. Surrender yourself to Jesus Christ and claim the victory that's yours. 
What are the idols of your heart? Yours are different than mine, maybe. But what are the idols? Allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you. You see, the gospel is never gonna have the power in my life and yours until we recognize what those idols are and we surrender them to God. And we say, God, with your help, I claim your forgiveness, I surrender myself to you, and I claim the victory that's mine through Jesus Christ.